Good afternoon, everybody. The attendees are just joining, so I may repeat myself a couple of times over the next couple of minutes. My name is Lindsay Bywood. I'm from the University of Westminster, where I'm a translation studies academic. Um, this panel is diversification for translators. Um, so I hope you're all, oh, you, it looks like you, did, you attend in alphabetical order, which is quite interesting. I can see the attendee list and it starts with the A's. How nice. So if anybody's got a, a first name that starts with a letter towards the end of the alphabet, that's why you have to wait. Um, OK, I think I know we've still got people joining. Um, we've got people saying hello in the chat. Thank you. That's really nice. So you'll see that you've got the facility to type in the chat and you've also there's also a Q&A panel. So if you can't see it, um, move your mouse or tap your screen down the bottom of your screen, probably depending on the version that you're using, you'll see Q&A and chat. You can ask questions in either the Q&A or the chat. Um, it's probably better to ask them in the Q&A because with so many people, I can tell you that there are 289 attendees. Um, questions might get lost in the chat so I'll do my best but if you've got a question probably best to put it in the Q&A okay I think we're just about there now so I'll start again my name is Lindsay Bywood I'm from the University of Westminster you're very warmly welcome to this panel which is diversification for translators we have three guest speakers here so we have Joe Terry, who's from Blue Whale Global Media. He's going to talk to us about specialising in sports, translation and interpreting. We've got Nicholas Niku, who's a freelance translator and editor, who's going to talk about the portfolio career that he has and, and how he got into that and its advantages and disadvantages. And we've got Jennifer. I have had a total blank on your surname, Jennifer. I'm so sorry. It's Jennifer Fox. Thank you. I knew it was a small name. Jennifer Park <laughs> um, from Voice and Script International is going to talk about subtitling and dubbing. So um, that's the mistake of the day over with. Um, I'm blushing now. Um, OK, so uh, moving swiftly on, as I say, I will try and uh, moderate questions and answers. Um, we'll do questions and answers at the end of all three speakers, but you can type them whenever you like and I'll make a note of them. So I'd like to pass on to Joe Terry, please. Joe, over to you. Thank you very much, Lindsay, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be in this, this forum. I'm quite frankly a little daunted because I did not expect to be speaking to above 300 people. So doesn't matter. Let's go, let's go ahead with it. And I hope you, have, uh, you find interesting what I have to say. i um, just going to share a screen here so we can get into my presentation. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that now. Uh, and I'll begin. My name is Joe Terry, and I am a translator, interpreter, and reporter in the world of football. Uh, the company that I work for is called Glo uh, Blue Whale Global Media, and we offer um, specialized football translations uh, for a variety of different clients, including UEFA uh, and FIFA, as well as, as, well as individual clubs. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about myself just very briefly, but then I want to talk more about my company and the work that we have to offer. And I hope it's going to be something that you will find interesting as well. Um, so I graduated from the University of Bath in uh, translating and interpreting in 2014. And I began uh, as a freelance translator, I'm sure like many of you here, um, spamming translation agencies, trying to find work wherever I could, trying to in do interpreting jobs wherever I could. But I realized already during my course that my, my real passion in translation was in football. Uh, and I began to discover that there is a, trans a segment of the translation industry which is alive and well in sports, in football in particular. And I'm happy to say it's been relatively unaffected by, uh, by COVID. So after um, doing a lot of work on a freelance basis for different clubs, uh, interpreting for press conferences, 
interpreting for Q&As and uh, translating for club websites and things like that. I was contacted by, by a company called Bluewell Global Media and invited uh, to join them in, in something more of a um, project manager uh, type of role. Um, what we do is we receive translation requests either from UEFA or, or directly from football clubs to translate typically interviews that they've conducted uh, with players and coaches. They will arrive to us in audio or visual format and our job is to provide transcripts of them which can then be used for subtitling, for, uh, for edits to be used in, in films or uh, in online materials, social media, etc. Um, we, as I mentioned before, we are a partner for UEFA, so we deal with a lot of the clubs uh, and national associations in competitions like the Champions League, the Europa League, uh, and in international football as well. We also have uh, contact with uh, the equivalent governing body for rugby, which is European Professional Club Rugby. And we're beginning to embark upon um, some new interesting projects uh, with FIFA, uh, among others. As I mentioned there, the majority of our work is uh, dealing with audio translations, um, both from source language to target language or even monolingually as well and uh, proofreading of, of, of that process as well. I just want to stop and talk a little bit about the, the nature of audio translations, because for me, it's, it's really interesting from a, a linguistic exercise as well. I think as translators, we often get used to just reading text, reading text, reading text, and that can be, so that's great for your passive comprehension, but I don't know about you, but I come, at languages, at translation from the point of view of someone who, who's a passionate linguist and wants to converse and speak with people. So doing this, uh, this type of work is great for your, for your oral comprehension. Um, and if it's in a, in a subject like football, which I'm passionate about, and I know many people are as well, it's, it's good for both of those perspectives, both linguistically and as a translation exercise. It also teaches you to really, understand to be able to differentiate between different dialects accents manners of speech and things like that uh, which as we know in the world of football is very varied because they're often not uh, the best speakers so the work that we offer is obviously it's paid professional experience as you would expect um, it's in my opinion slightly biased but i think it's very interesting as well especially if you're passionate about football um, and Along with the kind of the, the weekly day-to-day -day work that we do, uh, receiving these interview requests from, from clubs or from national associations or from UEFA, we also operate these translation projects during the summer, um, which is a, a huge translation project covering the major international football tournaments, where you as freelance translators will have the opportunity to work day-to-day uh, -day as the, the tournament progresses, translating interviews from coaches or players before games, after games. Um, you get to be part of this great big translation community and you really are able to feel part of uh, the football tournament. Uh, so now I'm sort of speaking directly to the, the freelance translators um, on this chat, on this webinar here, those who are perhaps interested in trying their hand at football translations. So what's the type of thing that, that you can expect? Well, uh, you can expect to be um, involved in, in interviews with players and coaches from clubs across Europe. So that means a whole variety of, uh, of languages. I noticed that a lot of the people in this webinar uh, are coming from all across Europe, which is great. And in this type of work, when you're dealing with audio translations, I often find actually to go against accepted practice, it's better or can be useful to have somebody working out of their mother tongue into English because it gives you that, that um, native comprehension, which might be the difference when you're talking with somebody, for example, with a very strong accent. I mentioned the tournament projects there. That's uh, something that happens alongside every major uh, international competition. It's a very exciting thing to be a part of. And there's a whole host of, of other material 
that as uh, freelance translators for us, you might expect to receive. Um, so what now? Well, if this idea of, of working uh, in football translation has interested you, uh, I would like to ask you to, to supply your details. Um, we hand out all of our work through Skype. Um, we do ask for uh, an online test for you to, par uh, to pass. And then after that, it's simply a case of waiting for work uh, from us. Um, on the next slide here, you'll see my email. So uh, for those who would like to uh, try out our test to be one of our freelance football translators, I invite you to, to jot this down. And if you have any questions about the, the nature of work, the type of work, please get in touch. I'll be obviously happy to answer a few questions here in the Q&A. I noticed that I've been speaking now for seven and a half minutes, which is roughly what Lindsay told us. Uh, so I'm going to stop here and then resume, hopefully, when some of you have uh, questions. So thank you very much for your attention. And I, I look forward to the rest of this, this panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. I was going to say you, uh, you're you setting a very high bar for punctuality. So yeah, it was the perfect length. So thank you very much. We've got nice, lively questions coming in the Q&A. Um, so please do put questions in the Q&A if you have questions for Joe or questions for any of our panelists. Um, moving swiftly on, next up is Nicholas Niku, who is going to talk about editing and I think also tutoring. Nick, is that right? Yeah, so diversification in general, but with a focus Perfect. on editing. Thank you. I will share my screen. We'll just get that set up now. Can everyone see this okay? Lindsay, was that coming up okay? Yes, sorry, I gave you the thumbs up. I didn't realize no you could see me. You can also see me as well. <laughs> uh, well, I can see you, yeah. Okay, but, so thanks very much for attending this talk. And I'm going to be coming from the perspective of someone who started as a freelancer five years ago now um, and has forged a career mixing different things uh, on a day to day basis. Um, you can see my Twitter handle at the bottom there if you want to get in touch at um, any point after this talk, and I'm just going to get straight into it now. So this is a little bit about myself. I'm a French and Spanish to English translator, but I also offer Greek as a language, and my primary specialisms are in the medical and the sports fields. Um, I'm a visiting lecturer at the University of Westminster also, teaching capitals and quality assurance. I'm a graduate affiliate of the ITI an associate of the Chartered Institute of Linguists, and I'm also the newsletter editor of the London Regional Group, which is a subgroup of the ITI. Again, my contact details are at the end, um, the bottom of this slide, if you want to get in touch with me. Nick, and sorry, this... your, your presentation is very blurry. Um, oh, okay. Let me see not, if I can. I don't know if you can do anything. If not, you could send it to me and I can share it. That's fine. Well, it's yeah. not, yeah, I'll go on. Is this a slide any better? Yeah, it looks slightly better, but there's not so much text. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I'll send the, I can send you the, um, the presentation to the Centre of Finance afterwards. Okay, okay. Um, so the key thing to bear in mind when you're starting out um, as a translator is that work is feast and famine. Um, that means that sometimes you will have periods when you have too much work and other periods when you're almost scrambling to find something to, to occupy yourself with. So before I started as a freelancer on a professional basis, I decided that I wanted to branch out beyond translation itself. It's important to know that under translation, there are different subject specialisms you can go into. And even in addition to that, there are also ways that you can cater for different language combinations. So I said before that I work from French, Spanish and Greek into English. And this means that if less work comes in for, for one of those language combinations, I can fall back on the other two. In addition to this, I said that I'm specialized in more than one subject. Medical is my primary specialism, but I also do uh, increasingly sports work. And I actually do work with Joe and Blue Whale, Blue Whale Global Media on this, so I can vouch for them. The benefit of this is not only that you have uh, greater possibilities of earning income, multiple income streams, 
but also that your day-to-day -day work does not get boring because you are learning new things every day. You're dealing with different kinds of texts in the case of some of the sports work, dealing with audio as well, and also dealing with different colleagues on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first thing I wanted to start off with in terms of diversification is not spreading yourself, is spreading yourself a bit, a bit further out rather than being focusing on one type of translation or being a generalist to consider specializing in specific fields and highlighting the importance of having more than one language combination if you do have that in your repertoire. For those of you who don't currently have more than one language combination, it's something to look into in terms of opening up more opportunities for translation work. Beyond translation as well, but within translation, is the idea of revision and that is editing other people's translations. For someone starting out in the industry in particular, revision can be invaluable in gaining subject specific expertise and learning how texts in a, a certain uh, field or subject area are written. It's also a good way of learning from other people who may have spent more time and had more experience in a given field. But beyond translation, I also offer editing services and sub-editing services specifically. This entails me working on magazines in English, as I'm a native English speaker, and improving the quality of the text, um, improving the layouts, coming up with headlines, coming up with stand first, which are the um, brief introducer of an article that comes directly after a headline, and also liaising with people at magazines to make sure that the content is fitting a brief and fitting a particular style guide. Now, this sub-editing is done on a freelance basis also um, in normal times within an office environment, but more recently due to the COVID pandemic, this has been done remotely. I tend to do most of my sub-editing on a business-to-business -business basis. These are magazines that are for a particular industry. So it's very important to have uh, an idea of how the industry works and to have an idea of industry-specific terminology if you decide to go down this path. In my case, I also use Adobe InDesign on a daily basis for my editing work, which is specialist software. This means that if you want to get into sub-editing as an alternative offering to your translation work, you would need to learn how to use specialist software, and this is paid software. So it may be worth looking into some free courses that you can do. I found one very good one on LinkedIn webinars um, about uh, using InDesign specifically for editing. So this is something that would be a good thing to look into before you try and apply to magazines or editorial houses for work. I've already mentioned, mentioned uh, rev revision before, but revision is different in that it is editing a translation in comparison to the original source text, whereas editing and sub-editing would be editing of a text originally written in a language, uh, such as English, um, with no element of translation um, in that. Now, in addition to both of those prongs to my offering as a freelancer, and here what you can see in the center is my logo, my brand as a translator, but also as a language professional, I also offer tuition. And I also, as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, a lecture at Westminster University. In the case of tuition, this was something that actually began before I went into my career as a translator. I did a BA at University College London in French and Spanish. And in the year between finishing that BA and starting my masters, I tutored a lot of individual students, both adults and students, across the entire year. And that is something that I've continued to offer um, as part of my uh, portfolio as a professional linguist. Now, tutoring is a completely different beast to both translation and editing. It requires great interpersonal skills. It requires you to have a very, very good knowledge of your source languages, in my case, French and Spanish. And it's also a great way of keeping abreast of developments in the language. If you need to teach someone how to learn a particular grammatical rule, you need to be 100% sure that you know how to do it and how to work with it um, to the highest ability. In the case of tuition, I've tutored students from GCSE level and A level to adult students, as I said. And there is a great amount of work out there in tutoring. 
You can define your own rates as you can for translation and revision. And one thing to bear in mind with tuition is that you will have to tailor lesson plans to individual students. And this can be quite a significant undertaking if you are taking on multiple students at the same time in multiple languages. So if you are looking to diversify, think about what other services you can offer. Reflect on your non-translation related experience. What other work avenues could you explore? Could you apply your translation related skills to other contexts? Do you have knowledge of specialist software that could get you work outside of translation? As I mentioned before, the use of specialist editing software such as Adobe InDesign. And when you consider all of these things together, this will give you more of an idea of what you can offer above and beyond your translation work. In my case, I find that having a hybrid of several different work avenues works well for me because they all feed into each other. All of them fundamentally are based on language. And as I said, tuition came out of my BA, my translation career came out of my MA, and my editing work came out of some pro bono experience that I got when I was doing both my undergraduate and postgraduate courses. So I think it's very, very important to bear in mind that idea of feast and famine. There will be times when you won't be getting as much translation work in as you would hope. So it really, really helps to spread out and look into different avenues that could give you some work as a freelancer. Thank you very much. Well, everybody's been practicing their talks, I think, because that was also spot on. So thank you very much, Nick. Um, just going to say to all of you panellists that we've got quite a lot of questions. So I think it might be a good idea if you have a look in the question panel, if you can type replies to anything that's not general. So anything that so there's some really quite specific ones for you, Joe. If you can have a look, if you type the replies, then everyone can see the questions and answers. So um, I think it's a good idea to do that. Uh, apologies to anyone that couldn't um, see the slides there i think it was it's next connection so there wasn't a lot we could do about that but i have shared his contact details um so if there's something you want to ask him then i'm sure he'd be happy to reply hopefully not all 380 of you but um <laughs> i'm sure nick can share his slides as well um okay so moving swiftly on just, when i'm replying is, do I, is it better to answer live or type answer right, because if you answer live it means you have to actually say it so yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so type the answer don't tick the answer privately box and that yeah. means everyone will be able to see your the, your the question and your answer got yeah thanks very yeah. much cool same for nick as well if you want to have a look nick and see anything that's specifically for you um i'll do that now thanks thank you. okay so moving on we're now going to hear from jennifer fox who works at voice and script international vsi and she's going to talk to us as i said about audiovisual translation thank you jennifer Hello everyone, it's nice to see so many of you here today. It's quite a surprise. So um, yeah, nice to meet you all. Um, you can call me Jenny. I currently work at Voice and Script International, which is a, um, a dubbing and subtitling company, essentially. So we are in the audio visual translation industry and we have studios across the world to help us localize content, essentially. So I specialize in video on demand content, um, which is on online, uh, platforms online. I'm, I'm sure a number of you are, are watching that at the moment. Um, so th that's, that's my specialism, but uh, BSI kind of dabbles in a lot of broadcast content as well. Um, my current role is as a, a team lead in VOD. So I, I have a small team. But within our wider team, there are project managers, coordinators and account managers, and we generally work with freelancers. So with my career, I took a, a slightly different route to, to Joe and Nick in that I work in house and my side of um, working at VSI is slightly more operational, more organizational. Um, however, the majority of us working there are, are linguists, um, have studied languages in the past or have a couple of, of other languages that we can um, kind of call on. So constantly, you know, when we're actually in the office, we're all currently working at home, we can, you know, there's often someone saying, oh, who, who speaks Turkish? Who speaks Arabic? Can someone help me with this, please? Um, so it's, you know, it's a great atmosphere to be in. 
Um, I'll just go into my route into languages a little bit before talking about the concerns or, or current trends in the vocalization industry. So um, neither of my parents spoke different languages apart from, from English at all. Um, I just, I really enjoyed uh, studying French and German in particular at school and then at university. And I actually did the same um, course as Joe. So I went to the University of Bath and did interpreting and translation, which was fantastic. And we, we dabbled a little bit in subtitling, which really, really caught my eye. Um, so following on from that, I decided to apply for VSI straight after university and, and I'm still there. So, yeah. So the reason I decided to go in-house instead of kind of launching into a career as an interpreter or a freelancer was um, the in-house lifestyle suited me better in terms of uh, my personality. I enjoy working in a team in kind of the same, same team going into the office every day and also the, the audiovisual side of dubbing really interested me. Um, and that is something that you often can't launch into unless you kind of, you go through a company. Um, so I started off as a project manager at VSI. So it's worth saying that um, this route would be for someone who, who doesn't necessarily get lost in the detail of translation. Um, that, is, that is a part of, of kind of being a linguist that I loved, but one part of things that I, I really also enjoyed was, was organizational, was uh, seeing the bigger picture. So that's the difference we're seeing here. Um, one thing I'd also say is that despite that fact, we, we are consultants essentially. So say uh, a studio comes to us with, with a problem. They say, oh, you know, we've got some, we can see some foreign dialogue in this series. We can, uh, there's a problem here. We're not sure what kind of translation approach to take. They would come to us and we would answer their questions. So our experience with translation, with theory that we studied at university always comes in handy just because you are, you are dealing with these very, very difficult topics all the time. So a couple of trends that we've seen in the, the industry recently. Yeah, I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so one has been English dubbing, which is, very, is a very interesting topic because as a nation, um, uh, the UK as, as well as other English speaking countries haven't really interacted with dubbing before. It's, it's not, not something that we've necessarily needed. However, now we've seen a huge increase in seeing um, original content coming from across the world, which of course needs to be translated. Hence why English dubbing has become more popular. We've also seen a difference in the way that we view content. So we're not just sitting at our, our TV screens all the time anymore. We are, we are viewing content when we are commuting when we're, we're doing tasks at home, when we're out and about. So we're not always looking at that screen and we can't always, you know, we, we don't always want to read the subtitles. Hence why dubbing is something that's becoming more and more popular in the industry. So that's something we are, we have launched in the last two years and um, something I've been quite involved in. Um, yeah, I might, I might end there just because I know we don't have much time. Um, but yeah, I'd be, appreciate any of your questions. If you are interested in kind of working for a company like VSI, feel free to look at our website. Um, just, just Google VSI online and um, yeah, looking forward to hearing your questions. Lovely, thank you so much. That's wonderful. I have actually put the website in the chat and in the Q&A, so um, if, if anybody's looking for it it's there but it's extremely easy because it is just vsi.tv so that's super easy i have to Thank declare you, i have to declare an interest here because i've worked for them for many years so um yeah okay so we've got lots of really nice questions some of which are i'm, I'm going to just ask this one directly for jennifer actually because um you won't have had a chance to have a look so natalie would like to know which subtitling companies could she contact in order to work on documentaries or films uh, interesting. So contact us. Um, we we do a lot of that. Um, I can't, you know, I can't talk about the the clients we work with or the content we work with, but it is very exciting. 
documentaries are certainly something that um, we really we need to rely on very very good translators for, and this is um, this is why clients come to us. So we're more of a uh, we, we really pride ourselves on our quality, on our attention to detail. So that's why clients might come to VSI because um, for, for documentaries in particular. Uh, as something that does require more research and does require more, um, so not necessarily prior expertise, but someone who is willing to do the extra work um, during that research translation stage. So come to us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so there's a few sort of general questions that I'd like to ask to all three of you. Um, there's been a few questions that have sort of come in under the, the, the umbrella of how do I get work when I have no experience? So how do, how do I get specialism? How do I sort of, you know, can I, for example, Joe, would you take me? I've got no experience or Nick, how would you, um, you know, how would you go about getting a job as a, as a sub editor if I had no, you know, if I, if I come straight out of university um, and similarly to, to Jenny. So um, somebody wants to start off with that. What do you do when you just qualified? I'm happy to dive in there because uh, it's something that I, I remember struggling with myself once I graduated. Um, and I can speak from the point of view of our company, which is that we actually, and I, met, I answered someone this anyway, we really like work, working with new graduates uh, because typically they come with uh, an open mind, a fresh attitude, happy to work in, in different ways, maybe, you know, the things that we because a lot of what we prize is speed. Um, football is a very intense industry and the deadlines are very short. People expect work immediately. So we really like working with graduates and we offer graduates the opportunity to take our test and to prove themselves good enough um, to use a, a football cliche and adapt it slightly to this environment. If you're old, if you're good enough, you're old enough. That's the way that we approach things. So yeah, please get in touch. Doesn't matter if you've had uh, two minutes of experience or two years. We're really happy to hear from graduates. Brilliant. Anybody else want to say something? I think Jenny, I might have something similar to say. Yes, I think I'd say um, one point I'd add would be um, I, I think it's very difficult as a as a freelancer to get started. I know Joe and, and Nick can can talk about this a little bit more. One thing I know that was quite easy for me was was getting into a company quite quickly with project management. Um, project management isn't for everyone, and it, sometimes you might want to get into the detail of translation and and being a linguist more. But I would say it's a good it's a good way into a company to see how things work, see how important it is to ensure that you you are networking, you are uh, speaking to lots of project managers who are the ones who who choose where work goes often uh, from companies. So it's uh, starting in house is 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 a way into the industry, and even if that's not where you want to end up, um, that's a, that could be a good place to start. Great. And um, Nick, anything to add? Yes, sorry, I'll just respond to another one on the Q&A. That's okay. Um, from my point of view, I did I, I did some, I mentioned it briefly in one of the Q&A answers, but I worked uh, for a magazine called Sounds and Colours, pro bono, um, for several, not several years, for a year or so in my final year of university. And because my title was sub-editor for them, and I'd been writing articles for them and editing content on their website, I gave me a portfolio to discuss when I did eventually contact clients. In addition to that, during my MA course, I did an entire module on editing, and it was skewed more towards editing of translations, but it still meant that I had tangible experience and also a pseudo qualification to refer to when I was contacting uh, people about editing work. But fundamentally, when it comes to editing, like with a lot of translation work, if you're working with direct clients, a lot of it does tend to be word of mouth. So once you get one client, uh, you will find that you get referred to others as long as you do a good job. Because um, organisations, and particularly magazines, um, they do require people at the drop of a hat. And if they need a sub-editor, um, sub-editor, for those of you who know what that was specifically, it's not just editing text, it's also making it fit into the final layout as it will appear as a magazine and coming up with additional content such as headlines and things. So 
if you're applying for work like that, you need to have a very, very good, you have basically have to have mastery of the language you're going to be working in, a very high level um, to be able to offer it. And people may require you to give some kind of evidence of experience or that you're, um, yeah, that you're willing to go up to the job. Beyond that, once you get the first job and do a good job, you'll get repeat work and you'll also be referred, hopefully, to um, clients, other clients through those people. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I've just realised I didn't mute myself, so you could probably hear me typing furiously in the background. So apologies for that. Um, and on the same sort of, sort of um, track, um, there's a few people asking about um, becoming a translator or working in these fields without a language degree or a translation first degree. Um, the specific question is, is it much harder for those of us without? I can quickly comment on this. Um, as I said, I did a BA in French and Spanish. And when I decided I wanted to become a translator, I quickly realized that certain clients at least would not take you on without an MA level qualification. So either a master's or there's a diploma in translation for those of you who don't want to do an entire MA course. Uh, but in my case, all of the research pointed to needing a master's to be able to get into certain types of translation. And again, Joe's talked about how there, there are ways for people um, who haven't necessarily got even a degree. Uh, but in my case, I needed not only the BA in languages, but also the MA uh, in order to be able to do specifically the medical translation work that I do. Um, and the fact that my MA course had a medical translation component meant that I was able to get work early on, uh, even though I did not have a medical background. Um, so that's my personal experience. I do know that many people who came to the industry in previous years didn't need um, an MA or a postgrad course uh, qualification to be able to do it. So that's only my personal experience that I can speak Anyone else want to say something about starting off without any qualifications or without those specific qualifications, rather, I should say? I think Nick summed it up really well there. Um, I would only add perhaps that the, the degree, I don't find that it, in real terms, obviously it was useful to learn how to translate and interpret and, and the techniques and, and things like that. But as much as anything else, it's a way of opening doors and giving yourself credibility. Uh, but I do think that there are other ways of achieving that. Um, the perhaps not doesn't have to be a master's, but a diploma or online courses, things like that. Um, pro bono work. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's not the be all and end all. But if you have the opportunity to do it, I would I would definitely recommend it. If nothing else, but for the fact that it's a very worthwhile and rewarding thing to do. Right, Jenny, anything to add? No, nothing to add on that. I, I'd, I'd agree with um, the point about having having that credibility, something to back you up. Um, I think often, yeah, often just, just having that gets you through the door. Um, I think it's the same with VSI. The way we, we vet people is we, we like to have, I think usually it's two, two years of freelance experience before we, we uh, send a test to someone. So it's, it's definitely having those prerequisites. I don't think we necessarily require a master's degree, um, but the degree is, is something or all the diploma or the qualification is something that does get you through the door. So I'd say it is um, really valuable. Thank you very much. And I'd just say that there are some people who I know are very experienced translators who are um, putting some really useful and interesting things in the chat. So uh, please do have a look at the chat um, for attendees um, for other perspectives um, and other interesting um, angles on, on the questions. Um, so we've got about three or four minutes. I'm going to slightly um, be a little bit, uh, not quite controversial, but I'm going that way. So there's a question about machine translation. So I'm wondering if, uh, so wait, let me find it specifically. I think it was just, do you use machine translation? But somebody already answered it, yeah. Okay, so just um, what is your view on machine translation? Let's start off with Nick. Um, I think it's not a blanket issue. It's neither good nor bad in itself. Uh, it would be very, very useful for certain types of translation and not so useful for others. Um, 
And I think one thing that needs to be cleared up is the fear around it, in that it's going to take all, all translation work or take the translator's, a translator's job. I think what it has done is it's modified what you need to offer as a language professional. And if clients are considering moving towards a machine translation platform over tangible, um, real, real life translators, then you need to be offering a service which is indicative of that difference. Um, as someone who does editing, as I said on a daily basis, um, being self-reflective, being aware of the quality of your, of your translations, having very, very strong research processes behind you, uh, keeping terminology databases, if you use computer-assisted translation, um, making sure that your resources are up to date and very, very accurate, that's stuff that can differentiate you um, and can make it clear that a client should go with you over a machine translation provider. But beyond that, you can also work with machine translation. Many translators do this, and unless the tasks that you're working on are confidential, and the client has said specifically you cannot use uh, machine translation to be able to translate them, many translators find that it can speed up their work, particularly with CAT tools that have dedicated plugins for machine translation. So I think there's a lot of doom and gloom around it. I think some of it's justified, but also I think people need to understand why certain things are moving towards that. And if you're aiming to go into a field, um, to, to consider going into fields where it might be less of a problem, such as in transcreation, where machines can only do quite so much, um, and localization, um, that might be something to look into. I can talk with that about in the medical sense. Uh, there are certain areas that I come across and certain text types that I come across that just would not be conducive to being run through um, a, a machine translation platform. They need a human eye to run over them. And that's where post-editing of machine translation comes in, which is another income stream that people could look into. Thank you very much. Okay, Joe, what's your view on machine translation? I'm going to talk specifically about machine translation football because it's something that we've actually kind of experimented with to see if it could give us an edge in terms of uh, speed of delivery. And we found that it, at the moment, it's really not up to the task. Um, I think perhaps because football is so idiom heavy, it's so jargon specific, because there is, there's so much variety of accent and dialect and quality of speech. Um, it just seems to throw machine translation off and then you almost spend more time having to edit it and knock it back into shape. So our approach at the moment is to avoid it. We try and use technology as much uh, to our advantage as possible. Just one way that we do this, for example, is we work in Google Docs and we have the translator and the proofreader kind of working at the same time. So the translator will be listening to the audio, translating, forging ahead, and the proofreader quite literally stays a two or three sentences behind. So that process of translation and proofreading almost starts to happen simultaneously. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my perspective on it. I, as far as we're concerned and my experience is that machine translation is not quite flexible enough to deal with what football needs it to do. Thank you very much. And Jenny, over to you. Machine translation, what do you say? I'd say that um, I, I'm all for using technology in our work. Um, and I think it's something that we definitely need to embrace. Uh, translators will never be uh, completely um, kind of uh, re reduced to, you know, completely replaced. Uh, and that's a fact. I think the translators or um, transcribers who start to use technology in their work to help them speed up the way they work or to improve the accuracy or the quality of what they output are the ones who will be really successful. Um, we've seen a lot of clients investing in technology uh, that's not necessarily machine translation, but um, uh, automatically transcribes work that can produce uh, a basic translation before we go into the script. And, and this, does, this does help. And it, it, it means that perhaps the work that is slightly simpler has been done for us already, but then we can go in there and as the experts go in and you know, change anything that you know, really matters to us or the, the work that is really complex, we're the ones who can address that. So I'd say that technology is something 
we definitely need to embrace in the localization or translation industry. And um, I'd, I'd say it's a, it's a good thing. Thank you very much. And that brings us very nicely to the end of our allotted slot. I'm sorry about the 21 outstanding questions. Any of you that have subtitling or dubbing questions, do feel free to come to my session at 3.30, which is specifically about subtitling, and I will try and answer you there if that helps. Um, I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Uh, it seems like there's lo lots of lively participation, which is great. So a massive thanks to Nicholas, to Joe, to Jenny for being willing to do this um, year after year. Um, every year it's different. Um, so super, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you for coming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the language show and have a good weekend. Hope to see you in person next time. Yes, I hope so. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.